In this lesson, we'll talk about one of the more complex aspects of algebra that you might find in the quantitative reasoning section of the GMAT Focus Edition, and that's going to be those problems involving inequalities. So what is an inequality? Well, an inequality indicates values that are greater than or lesser than another value. So the open end of the inequality sign faces the larger value. So for instance, five is greater than three. Now you can also have greater than or equal to, but for the purposes of this lesson, we'll be focused on solely greater than, less than. Greater than or equal to, you could certainly use, but it's actually less technically specific than the greater than or less than sign in math because greater than definitively cuts it off. And of course you could keep on writing decimals forever. So that's why we use the greater than, not greater than or equal to. It's technically more specific. And you can use inequalities to relate known values or variables. And you can algebraically manipulate and combine inequalities in a similar fashion as you do with equations provided that all values or variables in the inequality or inequalities are known to be greater than zero because it's negatives that make inequalities function differently than a straightforward equation. And you have to make sure that you're considering variables and whether or not it's possible that they could be negative to be careful. You can multiply or divide an inequality by a negative but the key here is you have to flip the inequality sign. So we'll be carefully doing that in some examples in this lesson. So strategically, if all values of an inequality problem are defined as being greater than zero, that means the known numeric values and the variables, definitely prepare to manipulate algebraically because it's relatively straightforward to do so. But do recognize that for the data insight section, Inequalities are not the same as equations in considering sufficiency for those unique data sufficiency questions in that particular section of the GMAT Focus Edition. And you can consider alternative tactics, especially modeling and logical evaluation for complex inequality problem solving questions in the quantitative section and potentially in the data insights section as well. So we remember our algebraic order of operations. First, we eliminate fractions or decimals by multiplying the full inequality by the least common denominator or a power of 10. We then work to efficiently simplify that inequality using the four basic functions illustrated in the bottom right-hand corner of the, the slide, following the PEMDAS order, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, avoiding negatives as much as possible. And lastly, you'll eliminate it exponents or radicals by appropriately raising or rooting the full equation, remembering to account for a negative if necessary. So we've got an example that might be a little familiar to you. We just changed the equal sign into an inequality sign. So we've got one quarter times the quantity 2x squared plus 8 in parentheses is greater than 34. So we first multiply the full inequality by positive 4 to eliminate the fraction. So we end up with 2x squared plus 8 is greater than 30 times 4, 120, plus 4 times 4, 16, 120 plus 16 is 136. Then we subtract the 8 from each side to find that 2x squared is greater than 128. Then we divide the inequality by 2 to find that x squared is greater than 64. And we square root the equation to find that x is greater than 8 but we also have to flip the sign for the negative possibility of the square root, which is negative 8. So we know that the solution to this inequality is that x is either greater than 8 or it's less than negative 8. And you have to be careful with those negatives involving square rooting on these types of problems. So solving inequalities with negatives. So first, you'll manipulate as much as possible without multiplying or dividing by a, a value less than zero. And remember that it's possible to add or subtract inequalities by a value that is negative without flipping the inequality. So you really just want to avoid having to flip the sign because it introduces a very easy mistake. Then you're going to multiply or divide the inequality by that negative as the last step and flip the inequality sign if necessary. 
And if you have time, you could check your solution against the original equation to confirm that you got the right outcome. So we've got a different inequality here. We've got negative one half times the quantity 18 plus y is less than negative 5y. So we'll multiply the inequality just by 2, not by negative 2, keeping the negative part to the end if necessary. And we've got now negative 1, or just negative, times the quantity 18 plus y is less than negative 10y. Then we distribute the negative, so we've got negative y minus 18 is less than negative 10y. We can add y to both sides. So now we've got negative 18 is less than negative 9y. <clears throat> we divide by negative 9 and flip the sign, and we find that 2 is greater than y. And you can actually confirm this by rearranging it step 3. We could add 18 and 9y to both sides just to move things around, and we discover that 9y, the positive, is less than 18, the positive. And once again, if we divide the inequality by 9, y is less than 2, even though it's just flipped around in our two examples. So you can test to make sure that you did your manipulation properly. Of course, that does take a little bit of time, and we have to be cognizant of time management on the exam. Now, what are known as compound inequalities? First, you want to split your compound inequality into as many separate inequalities as necessary, basically one for each inequality sign. Then you want to seek to isolate for the sought value in each inequality, the individual ones. And you'll recombine your compound inequality if that's helpful to solve the problem or evaluate a data sufficiency in the data insights section. <clears throat> so our example here, similar to what we just saw, but now we've got greater than symbols on both sides of the one half, the quantity 18 plus y. So we start by splitting into two inequalities. We've got three is less than one half 18 plus y, the quantity. And then on the right hand side of the vertical line, we've got one half times the quantity 18 plus y is less than negative four y. So we'll focus just on the left inequality first. We know that three is less than one half the quantity 18 plus y. So we multiply the inequality by two to get rid of the fraction. Six is less than 18 plus y now. Then we just subtract 18 from each side, and we discover that y is greater than negative 12. Simple enough. So we've solved the left inequality. Now we need to solve the right inequality. We've got 1 half, the quantity 18 plus y is less than negative 4y. So we multiply the full inequality to get rid of the fraction. We get that 18 plus y is less than negative 8y. We will add 8y to each side to try to avoid having to flip the sign, and we find that 18 plus 9y is less than 0. Then we subtract 18 from both sides. We find that 9y is less than negative 18. We divide by 9. We find that y is less than negative 2. And we can recombine the inequalities now to find that y has a range in that it is greater than negative 12, but less than negative 2. You can also potentially manipulate systems of inequalities, and these are used to evaluate individual variables or combinations of variables involving multiple inequalities, but it depends on the direction of the inequality signs, and this is, again, why it gets more complex with inequalities as opposed to equations. If you have two inequalities with the sign facing the same direction, they can be combined with addition without any change to the direction. But you have to have two inequalities uh, with signs in opposite directions to combine them through subtraction, taking the direction in the final inequality of the first inequality. And we'll see how that works out here in a moment. Strategically, you really only want to com uh, combine systems of inequalities if you are absolutely certain of the steps needed to complete the combination. If you have any doubts, look for an alternative tactic. You can seek methods of manipulation to facilitate addition of two inequalities pretty freely because it's not that complex, but you have to be really, really careful when you're combining through subtraction because of the opposite sim, uh, the opposite direction thing, making sure you take the right inequality sign for your results. And so recognize that you may decide to not necessarily do this the technical way. But to add a system of inequalities, first you'll stack the equations vertically, aligning the variables, and ensuring the same direction for the inequality signs, pretty much in a very similar fashion to what you do with, the, with an equation, system of equations. 
Then you're going to carefully add your inequalities, keeping the inequality sign facing the same direction, and simplify following the rules of your inequality manipulation. So let's take a look at a couple of inequalities that we might be able to simplify. So <clears throat> we will stack the inequalities and rearrange the sign to the same direction. So we had 5x plus y is greater than 45. So let's just put the 2y on the right hand side and the 2x minus 6 on the left hand, or sorry, the 2y on the left hand side and then the 2x minus 6 on the right hand side so that the inequality can face left as did the top one. And so if we wanted to work through this, we can just add the two inequalities and we discover that 5x plus 3y is greater than 2x plus 39 because we did 45 minus 6. Then we can just subtract 2x from each side to simplify the inequalities. And we then divide by 3 to find that x plus y has to be greater than 13. And that is a bit simpler. If the problem we're asking, what must x and y be greater than? Now we know it's 13. Now, the tricky part, subtracting a system of inequalities. So first, you have to stack the equations vertically, aligning the variables, and ensuring opposing directions for the signs. Then you want to carefully subtract your inequalities, applying the sign of the subtracted from inequality to the resulting inequality. So the top inequality sign ends up being what you result with. And then you're going to simplify following the rules of inequality manipulation. So here we're going to try to find what y is greater than if 5x plus y is greater than 45 and 2x minus 6 is less than 2y. So we stack the inequalities, keeping the signs in opposing directions. So we've got 5x plus y is greater than 45, and 2x minus 6 is less than 2y. We then multiply the top equation by 2 and the bottom by 5 to produce the common factors for potentially eliminating x, which is going to be a common multiple of 10. So we've got 10x plus 2y is greater than 90, 10x minus 30 is less than 10y. Now we're going to subtract the inequalities applying the top inequality sign. So 10x minus 10x, that goes away. 2y minus minus 30 becomes plus 30, and we keep the greater than symbol facing to the left. Then we've got 90 minus 10y. Now we can add 10y and subtract 30 on each side. We get 12y is greater than 60. We then divide the inequality by 12 to find that y must be greater than 5 for this system of inequalities to be valid. That's a lot. And you may not actually end up doing that depending on how the problem is structured. But let's head on over to the whiteboard to see how inequalities might present themselves on the quantitative reasoning section of the GMAT Focus Edition. Here we have a Roman numeral style problem solving question. And even with the Roman numerals, of course, we set up the scratch work as always. And we will probably want to write out the numerals just to see what combinations are possible and potentially inform a savvy evaluation of the options and the numerals. So if we skip to the end of this problem, we're being asked for what must be true. And we've got a couple of baseline statements. We know that x is less than negative 1. We know that that's, of course, less than 0, which is less than y, which is less than z, which is less than 1. Wow, that's quite a compound inequality. Now, looking at this, I probably don't want to split this into five different inequalities. That would take a lot of time, and I may actually have to relate the ones further down to the others, and it's just like, that's a lot. But because we're being asked for what must be true, and it's not a specific individual value, this is going to be a logical evaluation clue. So we will also probably want to write out what the Roman numerals say. And we've got x is, whoops, all right, xy is less than xz. We've got Roman numeral 2, which says that xz is less than zero. And Roman numeral three, which says that x, y, z is less than zero. So looking at this structure, 
it's probably easiest to evaluate Roman numeral 2, because I can see that x is a negative, z is a positive, so any time we have a negative times positive, plus a couple of letters there, that's going to be equal to a negative. So that tells us immediately that Roman numeral 2 is absolutely true, and that eliminates A and C, because they don't include 2, but you'll also notice that 2 is the most frequently occurring, of course. And then we've got X times Y times Z. Well, again, we can just focus on the negative positive thing. So we know we've got a negative times a positive. Which is going to produce a negative. And then that negative is going to be, because this would be x, this would be y, and then that negative times a positive, because that's going to be z, is still going to be equal to a negative. So that means that Roman numeral 3 works too. So on the exam, you probably just want to deal with the logical evaluation approach here rather than getting into the technical. But let's take a look at the technical for Roman numeral 1 as well. Because if we've got xy is less than xz, well, you could see the common factor of x. So we can divide both sides of the inequality by x. So the x's cancel out, but we know that x is less than 1. So that means we have to flip the sign, and that tells me that y is greater than z, and that directly violates the original inequality. So even though we didn't need to do that, we see how it would work. So let's scroll on down and take a look at another example here that might benefit from a little bit of inequality evaluation. This time it's a word problem. So let's set up our scratch work as we do always. We got A, B, C, D, E, put a little line over top. We skip to the end and we're being asked for the minimum number of drivers. So M, I, N, number of drivers. And that doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot to me at the outset, but we know that it will in a moment. And since I've got real numbers, I might as well write them out just in case an alternative tactic proves itself useful. So we start from the beginning. We've got Shenandoah Trucking has a number of deliveries to make on a given day, and the total distance that must be driven to complete them is 5,500 kilometers. So our total distance is equal to 5,500 km. And we know that no driver for Shenandoah is allowed by law to drive more than 300 kilometers in a day. So the max km per driver per day is equal to 300. So we know we're being asked for what is the minimum number of drivers that Shenandoah can use to complete its deliveries, assuming no one's necessary stops are made. So they basically just continue throughout the 300 kilometers for the day. So the first thing you want to do here is logically eliminate the impossible choice, which is going to be choice C. We can't have a third of a driver. You don't care how short the man is. It's not nice to call him a third. So we get rid of C. Now, we know that 5,500 divided by the number of drivers has to be greater than 300. So, or sorry, it has to be less than 300. So now we just multiply both sides by D. We discover that 5,500 is equal to 300 D. And we got to do a little long division we got to divide by 300 on each side. So if we were to come up here and divide 5,500 by 300, 300 is going to go into 5,500 once. 
subtract out the 300. We then have 2500. Zero, zero. That's going to go in there 18 times, which is 24 and 0, 0. And so we then, oh, and I should have kept my inequality because I actually end up kind of walking into the trap potentially, which we were kind of guarding against at the outset, which is when we complete our long division, we get down to 100 and 300 goes into 100 0.3 times. And we're going to end up with that repeating 3-3. Three, three. And if we're not careful, we'll end up picking 18 and a third because that's exactly what it would have been. But we know now that the D has to be actually greater than that 18.33. And so the first possible integer number of drivers that we could have would be the next integer up, 19. And you can see, again, not necessarily a difficult problem, but it has some traps in there. And you just have to be careful. Use the inequality, not the equation, when you're being asked for what is the minimum, what is the maximum, trying to figure out what a range might be. And eliminate impossible choices at the very beginning to potentially guard against that trap in the first place, the 18 and the third. So go ahead and practice some inequality problems on your own to improve at this somewhat more difficult aspect of the GMAT focus quantitative reasoning section.